super excited to be here. I am recording. <laughs> Thanks, Don, for your notes. I uh, actually changed the settings, so as soon as uh, the music started playing earlier, it started recording. As soon as I joined the meeting, it started recording. So it's a, it's a beautiful situation. Thumbs up to everybody. What an amazing day. It's been, uh, I don't know, here in, in Johnson City at Venovium, we had two days of ferocious winds in the nighttime that uh, was quite incredible. We actually had, if you, if you know our open late sign, we had the totes that say open late on them. Uh, they fell over and one of them, uh, two of our totes are in our neighbor's property. The open late sign is somewhere, branches fell, but nothing structural uh, like some of our friends down the road, like French Connection, some other wineries actually had some roofs parts come off. And so we got lucky, but we got cool weather it's a beautiful day. I gave Nacho a bath this morning, so hopefully he will lick his ass less. You know, because he's sitting right next to me. He kind of goes everywhere I go type of situation. We're talking about you, Nacho. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. This is the last class of a six-class series, and it's uh, right on time, actually. Um, so we are open, and you should come visit us. We miss you, and we hope that we can drink wine in person together even though we will continue to drink wine over the internets together in the future. And that's something that I'll talk about uh, at the very end of today's class. We've actually started to plan uh, the next three classes with uh, a good friend of the business and good friend of the winery named Julia Dixon, uh, another sommelier from Austin. She used to be the sommelier at Jeffrey's uh, and at Perla's and has worked directly under June, a master sommelier. And uh, super excited to be able to welcome her into this series. Um, and then after that, we have uh, another Psalm who wants to join us, Alex Bell, who is one of the sommeliers at, um, at Aviary on South, Con or excuse me, South Lamar. He's one of the owner operators there. And uh, so we're gonna continue and we'll talk about that as we kind of move along. So why do red wines make you hungrier? I don't know, well, we'll talk about that, but I think everything just makes me hungry. So maybe I just say that because I think we should all just eat more. So you guys, we have a, a pretty, I, I, I mean, the agenda is not highly detailed here, but uh, there is quite a bit of information to go through. Piedmont or Piemonte, if we were Italian saying that word, is a super special region in Italy, uh, not only to the Italians, but really to the rest of the world. And there's many reasons for that, not only in terms of how wines are produced, the grapes that they grow, the styles of those wines, but really the, the cachet, the brand, the the ageability, the, 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 the food and wine pairing capabilities is pretty tremendous. And so it's a super exciting region to talk about. And uh, it's definitely the class that I wanted to end the series on just because some of these wines that we're gonna taste, well actually both of these wines we're gonna taste while have a, 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 a counterpart that's two times, three times, four times their price point. It's one of these regions where you can get wines in the mid 20s uh, that drink incredibly well that you could age for several years and, and be very happy with the drinking experience or you could drink them right out of the box or right out of the bottle and, and be uh, super happy with that experience. So let's see. Everyone seems to be signed in at this point. Open your chat if you haven't already. And uh, just like we did last time, we're gonna start by actually tasting these wines. We're gonna break them down by their structure. Um, I did pull the text sheets, so we will actually go through the text sheets as well so you can know how the wines were produced. Um, and then there's, you know, part of this, while the, the next kind of bullet point on the agenda is not really so much pertaining to Piedmont specifically, it's more pertaining to Italian wine in general, is kind of labeling practices for Italian wine. It is the most confusing out of all the regions that we will taste or, or you'll taste um, because of how they can label their wines. And so we need to talk about how wines can be labeled in Italy. Granted, if you're drinking a, a wine from Greece, you know, that language is not readable in the first place. Uh, so that's also a very confusing label, but it's pretty standard in terms of Appalachian grape vintage. In Italy, it's, they add a whole other layer, which is a style of a wine. And so really there's many different ways in which a wine can be labeled. So we're gonna talk about labeling Italian wine and the confusion that that creates. And then we're gonna jump into the Piedmont and we're gonna break the Piedmont down uh, really in terms of, let's start at the kind of the, the nucleus, which is the terroir of the place. What makes the place unique from a geography perspective? What makes it place from a, from a varietal perspective, uh, both red and white? 
And then we'll talk about some of the cultural things like cuisine, which is super important. And uh, let me kind of go back and now answer Sarah's question. Um, the reason why uh, red wines and really white wines make you hungry in general is not really red or white. It's the fact that we are drinking older world wines, wines that were actually created to go with food, wines that uh, on their, on their, at their core are really geared towards or, or have a very prominent acid structure, the wines that make you salivate, the wines that seem somehow incomplete without food, meaning it's not a wine that while, yes, you could open a bottle and sit on your porch and drink the whole bottle and be very, very happy with that, at some point you're going to want some meat or some cheese or something to nibble on. Whereas if you're drinking like a, a Dry Creek Valley Zinfandel or uh, some other new world wine that is very rich and full, it has a, a complete flavor profile that really doesn't need food. It's, it's there, it's complete. It's not really, uh, 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 while you compare to it, it's not a completely wine that's geared towards uh, food and wine pairing. And so that's why I say they're gonna make you hungry. They're gonna make you salivate. They're slightly bitter. Uh, and all of those things kind of turn your, um, your mechanisms for eating on, just like an aperitif or a digestif. These are things that either help you get hungry or help you digest food, which is why the, the world of beverage is so incredible, both in terms of, I got bugs, not, not on me or in me, just around me. Um, the world of beverage, just because there's so many ways in which you can drink a beverage, we look at it, right, one for hydration, but they also, you know, they lead to the next experience. And that's what's super special about beverage in general, but particularly old world wines where they, they tend to lead you down a path, both in terms of acid and tannin and bitterness and body, uh, towards the next evolution of whatever experience that you may be having with wine or food. That's a kind of a long-winded answer. Wes, pass the plate. Wes, what are you eating? Uh, charcuterie. Char charcuterie. <laughs> nice. You know, I, it, this was like a... Uh, the fifth element where you can push a button on a microwave and you get the thing that you want, like a turkey or the charcuterie. Uh, you know, it's like the period of the Jets as we thought we'd be further along than we are, except we're stuck at home trying to figure out how to drink wine together. <laughs> Where's my flying car? Exactly. Exactly. Okay, you guys. So let's, um, let's go ahead and taste. So if you haven't already, we're going to start with a Dolcetto. The Dolcetto is, is, is your lighter bodied wine. So let's start there and then we'll kind of move across the board. I will actually spend some time on these varietals, what's classic, what we should be looking for, but let, let us not let the, the, the teacher give you the answers. Let us kind of direct what our sensations are, what the experience is, and then see if what Wine Folly actually has to say is what we think is correct. Okay, so give it a swirl. And again, when we talk about structure, the six main parts of structure, acetanin, alcohol, sugar or dryness, color and extract, and then we want the aroma and then the character of that aroma, meaning the ripeness level of that aroma. So some of you that have been with us all six classes, this is, while it may be becoming monotonous that we're doing this, it's very good that we're doing this because you're getting better and better at understanding how your palate is reacting to, to all these words. Okay, so let's start with color. If you were in the class on Monday where we looked at Cabernet Franc, and I said Cabernet Franc is the true cherry color of cherry. If that's the definition of cherry, the question then becomes, is this more cherry, more red violet than cherry, or is it more kind of red brown verging to the right of cherry? And just based off of color, this wine is really to the left of cherry, almost going towards roomy, a uh, roomy, uh, uh, ruby, or even slightly some violet hues there. So I would say it's a little bit uh, more purple, a little bit more red violet than cherry. Super simple, let's move on. Let's give it a, a swirl and a smell. Again, the whole idea with swirls and smells is keep it simple. Two non-fruits, two fruits. I love this wine, I've already drank a lot of it. This is the wine that I said in the last class is almost like the perfect wine. Uh, it's got incredible value at a price point. It smells amazing. It just drinks super well. 
it's enjoyable. Okay, so two non, or let's go two fruits, two fruits. Um, for me, I would go like an anise character, like a licorice anise, something sweet, uh, anise-y like. Star, uh, um, uh, the actual, the herb, the anise. Um, and then the other fruit, the other uh, fruit would be um, kind of a raspberry, simple. The raspberry is almost verging into something overripe. Um, and it's highly aromatic and sweet. While it's not hot and candied, it's almost like a gummy raspberry, okay? And then two non-fruits. I guess technically a niece could be a non-fruit, so let's throw out another fruit. Uh, for me, I think the other fruit would be like plums, like the skin of a plum. Uh, kind of very, not so much tart, but almost plum ver verging on a pruny character. Again, not so overripe that it's a raisin, but it's got that dark kind of purple plum, purpley, like if I thought of a color for this wine, it would definitely be purple. It smells purple, just like Prince. And then non-fruits, I'll continue with anise, a little bit of that star anise, and then also some purple flowers, like a violet. It smells clean, it smells pretty, it's highly aromatic. Okay, let's give it a taste. Uh, I'm gonna continue talking, taste a couple of times, and then we'll go back and talk about it. The whole idea is, to, again, to forget your first taste, set your palate, and then we'll judge kind of the next few tastes after that. You know, as you kind of kind of get the appreciation for the wine, the wine is, you know, in the world of earthy or fruity, it's, it's definitely fruity on the palate. It's quite pleasant. Um, but in terms of the structure, it's soft, right? And so right now, uh, in terms of the aroma, there's nothing there that says any type of oak character. Um, I, I, you don't get anything woody or earthy bound or oak character on the palate. Um, so really the first impression of this wine is a, a very fruit forward style wine from the Piedmont or the Piemonte. Not very much oak influence on the wine. Okay, so let's take another taste. We're going to taste, again, I, for me, I always like to taste in three tastes. Taste for dryness. Is it sweet? Is it not sweet? What's the level of dryness? Then we'll taste for acid. How acidic is it? Uh, we'll talk about tannins, and we'll talk about body. So give it a taste. Okay, you guys remember the Cabernet Franc or the Pinot Noir, if you weren't in part of those classes, I will say that this wine is not as dry as a Cabernet Franc or not as dry as a Pinot Noir. So we will define those varietals classically as dry wines. This wine is, while still dry, is verging on medium dry, okay? or. Or, or medium minus dryness, well that sounds confusing, so I will say just medium dry. Um, it's not sweet, but it's not as dry as the other two wines. It doesn't, medium dry does not mean that the wine actually has residual sugar in it. What it really means is that there's a ripeness of fruit that is creating a situation where there is uh, an, uh, an elevated level of glu glucose or fructose, which is giving the, the sensation to the palate that the wine is more fruity. These are the wines that on some level, again, you can kind of give them to people and they will say, this is wine is a little too sweet. When in reality, the wine is fruity. The wine is definitely fruity on the palate. Um, and so we will define it as medium dry. Okay, let's take a taste for acid. Again, the question with acid is how much does it make you salivate? Not a whole lot. It's soft, it's fruity, it's, it's juicy, but in a ripe fruit character, not in a high acid character, which is, Rob, sorry, I'm attached to a microphone. I lost my note sheet. The wind is, while it's beautiful, it took, took away the, the notes. I appreciate that. 
Um, so the, it's juicy in a ripe fruit character, not in a high acid character, which is what we're going to kind of feed this into, which is what is the classic character of Dolcetto? Dolcetto uh, literally means the little sweet one and not by the, the level of residual sugar, but by the fact that the, the fruit character can kind of lend itself to being sweet. Um, the tannin structure is super soft uh, and chewy. It's almost like uh, kind of like, like you have a little bit of a bu purple bubble gum in your mouth. And then the acid structure is also soft. So soft tannin, soft acid, ripe fruit kind of just lends itself to this kind of a character that makes it feel like it's uh, not 100% uh, dry. Okay, what is off dry then is what Wes is asking. So the definition of off dry really is, is the amount of residual sugar that is noticeable on the palate. And typically the human palate, the average palate, can taste at, at, kind of at a, at a minimum 1% residual sugar. When we say a wine is very dry um, or bone dry, what we really mean is really 0% residual sugar. When we say a wine is off dry or in the spectrum of off dry, what we really mean is a wine that is really above 1% residual sugar. And then once we kind of get above 4% residual sugar, we will then call that wine a sweet wine and therefore a dessert wine. So part of understanding wine is setting definitions that we can kind of abide by. And that's, that's, that's the theory, right? And so uh, an off dry wine is really a wine that ranges between one and 4% residual sugar, um, also known as 10 to four, uh, 10 to 40 milligrams per liter of residual sugar. That's kind of the, the European nomenclature for how to define sugar. And then really anything under 1% uh, residual sugar is considered uh, this range of dry to medium dry. And so while there is, this wine is not void of sugar because the wine is fruity, um, the reality is it's not considered a, a sweet wine or an off dry wine, it's still technically a dry wine. Yeah, those, the question is, is are those guidelines in terms of off dry, are those guidelines uh, globally accepted or typical worldwide? And I would say yes. Most schools will teach that that range of off dry is one to 4%. The difference, however, being is that when you get to the European model of what is a, considered a wine for dessert, um, their dessert wines can be, you know, uh, 2%, 3%, 4%, kind of in the off dry range, just because those dessert wines are meant to pair with wine or foods or desserts that aren't nearly as sweet as what we may be thinking of as a, an American dessert, which is way sweeter. So yeah, so it, it is possible to use an off dry wine to pair, to, to pair with a dessert. It's also very possible to pair a dry wine with a sweet dessert. You know, this is kind of very classic examples of what's, you know, this contrast of bitter and sweet. You take a bitter wine and a sweet food or a sweet wine and a bitter food. Sometimes you can create harmony just because the opposites attract. It's not always a given, um, but that's kind of the, the nuance of a food and wine pairing, which is obviously a topic uh, for another day. Okay. So we, we kind of defined the, we said that the wine is medium dry. Uh, we're on to this question of, uh, we said uh, acid, we said less acid than uh, it's softer acid. So we would say kind of, I wouldn't say it's medium acid. I would say it's light acid, almost medium minus acid. It's not void of acid. There is some freshness there. Freshness meaning it's not sticky. It's, there is some acid. There is some level of moisture on the palate but it is not nearly as acidic as the Pinot Noir or as the Chardonnays or as the Cabernet Francs or some of the other wines. It's kind of on the same level of acid as let's say a Cabernet Sauvignon would be or even a, a, a Merlot. Let me pour some more wine. So we need a taste for body. You know what I'm gonna say? What I'm gonna say is, is it fuller than or lighter than the body of a Chardonnay? Would you drink this wine before or after a Chardonnay? If we know Chardonnay is medium bodied and medium dry, we know that this Dolcetto is medium dry or dry verging on medium dry. 
Is it fuller body than a Chardonnay? If, if the answer is I don't know, then let's, let's go one, let's, let's create a little bit more of a nuanced situation. Would you drink this wine before Merlot? That Merlot would be the next shift in body, but the same level of dryness as a Chardonnay. So a Merlot would be medium full bodied and medium dry. Would I drink this wine before Merlot? I think that's the easy one, I would say absolutely. Let's go to the opposite of Chardonnay. The opposite of Chardonnay was our Cabernet Franc that we had yesterday or on Monday. The question is, uh, another good example of that would be a Sauvignon Blanc or um, a Pinot Grigio or even a Riesling, depending on where it was in the world. Uh, I'm thinking of German Rieslings, uh, even possibly Alsatian Rieslings, but Alsatian Rieslings tend to be um, more body than a German Riesling. So let's go with German Riesling. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc, you could go most sparkling wines. The question is, is would, I, would I drink this wine after a Sauvignon Blanc, after a Cabernet Franc, after a Chenin Blanc, a Pinot Gris, a Pinot Grigio, a Gruner Veltliner? I think the, the short answer is absolutely, right? Um, so we're kind of in like those extremes while we know we are not lighter bodied than a Cabernet Franc, we know we're not Cabernet Franc, and we know that we're not as full bodied as a Merlot, we're still somewhere in the middle. Um, the reality is, is that this wine is also medium bodied and medium dry. And so in the world of what do I drink first, Chardonnay or Dolcetto, the reality is, is you could probably put these wines at, at the same course in a meal and go back and forth because they have the same structure. Um, one has a different fruit profile, different uh, overall character of fruit uh, in terms of the, uh, the ripeness of fruit, but also the type of fruit compared to the Chardonnay. But on a structure basis, they're both medium bodied, medium dry, okay? And, and so knowing that, we kind of have an idea of what we can do with it from a food and wine pairing perspective, but we also know that, um, that it may be a really great complement for a, a, a course if I can't find a Chardonnay and I, or I need a red wine in the place of a white wine situation, okay? And part of this understanding of body lends itself to being able to replace wines. Um, one of the classes that Julia will be doing is if you drink this, then that kind of situation where if you are constantly going to Chardonnay, for example, What's the wine that you could drink instead of a Chardonnay? Um, so if this, then that will be one of her classes that she teaches, which will be a, a super exciting class, I think. Okay, so we have a medium bodied, medium dry, uh, lower, medium minus acid, a lower acid wine. Tannins are soft. Color, we've defined color. Aromas, we've defined aroma. Okay, so let's put it all together. We have a... A um, uh, 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 wine from Dolcetto that has characters of slightly ripe to overripe plum or plum skin and raspberries with some notes of star anise and um, white uh, violet purple flower. The wine overall, in terms of its structure, is medium bodied, medium dry with soft tannin uh, and also a uh, medium minus acid or lower acid. Okay, that sentence tells me a whole lot. <laughs> sometimes you don't like Chardonnay and sometimes you do. Okay, so that's that wine. Let me pull up the tech sheet, so let's go back. I'm gonna remove the agenda for the moment. Um, maybe, if you can't read this, I can screen share it. I don't know if it's too small. Is it legible? The top half is in Italian. The bottom half is in English. Can't read it? I can't, yes, no? Okay, what it's saying is uh, your production area is within the district of Barbaresco. We understand that. Um, your exposure is southeast. We're gonna get to all this geography stuff. You're, you have your altitude, your grape variety, 100% Dolcetto, aging in stainless steel tanks for, for six months no oak aging, type of soil, vine age, yada, yada, yada. So 100% Dolcetto harvested really in the last week of September 
fermented, fermented dry, and then spent an extra six, six to eight months in a stainless steel tank, and then it was bottled. Okay, we're going to talk about why Dolcetto um, is super important for the region, but before we kind of talk about the regional stuff, here is your wine folly. This is what wine folly says is the primary flavors, plum, blackberry, cocoa, black pepper, violet, kind of, you know, it depends on what you're getting, you know, how ripe the wine is, but I feel like we're definitely on this plummy purple kind of dark buried uh, profile. Um, definitely purple flowers, which is what a violet is. And in terms of dryness, the wine, you can see the spectrum here. It's not that dry. It's not that full bodied. Um, or it's not as full bodied. It's low in tannin, meaning, let me go back to, to dryness. If this wine had oak, this wine would be shifted in body and I would say that it's probably the equivalent to a Merlot. The fact that the wine does not have that much tannin because of oak, I don't have that much kind of textural body to kind of make the wine medium full bodied as they have it listed here. The wine is super low in tannin, the wine is super low in acid, and it's also low in alcohol, right? It's a, it's a very pleasant wine because it doesn't have a lot of pointy structure to it that lends itself to a kind of a very pleasant drinking experience. All right. For me, I, I just, I feel like this is, I made the comment last class, it's almost the perfect wine because you can just drink it. It's super food friendly for the right types of food. I'll talk about food and wine pairings when we get to the cuisine portion of the class. Okay, let's go to the Nebbiolo. Wow, this wine is just totally aromatic and coming out of the glass. Super pretty on the nose. Okay, in terms of color, let's start with color. Um, okay, Nebbiolo. Let's start with the characteristics of Nebbiolo a bit. Nebbiolo is somewhat of an anomaly in the sense that it is a thin skin varietal. Like we talked about thin skin varietals with Cabernet Franc and Pinot Noir. Uh, Nebbiolo is also a thin skinned varietal um, that produces a wine that's high in acid, high in tannin, and high in alcohol. Okay, and we're going to talk about those three things in terms of what's the why behind it. But again, it's a thin skinned grape that produces high acid, high tannin, and high alcohol. Okay, the color of the wine, because of its thin skin, is lighter, like a Pinot. Uh, and then it's always on the spectrum of red brown, garnet to the right of garnet, almost going to brick red. We call it tile red. Uh, you can even almost get like a little bit of a clay pot character out of the wine but it's to the right of Garnet. I have friends in my line, that's okay. Um, and so, classic, classic Nebbiolo, it's never gonna be a super dark wine. Wines that, Nebbiolos that you get that have a high level of extraction will never be as highly extracted as what you can get from a Cab or a Merlot or a Malbec or a Sangiovese even. Okay, let's talk about uh, the, the rest of the wine, the aroma and the character of the aroma. So let's, two fruits, two non-fruits. Uh, in terms of fruits, I still get raspberry. Raspberry is like one of these things that I feel like comes through quite a bit with the red wines from, from the Piedmont. But this raspberry is definitely more alcoholic. It's almost like you made a cough drop out of a raspberry. So it's almost medicinal raspberry. And really the, the fruit is not nearly as pronounced as the non-fruits. Uh, and so I'm, I'm actually, while I get red berry fruit, I, I could maybe get some like figs or some date character. Really it's, it's minor. The things that really come out is, uh, are herbal. Uh, things like, like a star anise, like a leather, like a rose water, roses in general. 
There's also a little bit of a, of a savory mushroom character, almost truffle-like. Um, and then there's a, a kind of a sweet, spicy, punchy, fresh herb that I will probably, uh, for me, it lends itself to more of a, a, a floral rosemary, almost like you just cut rosemary, even like, or even the lavender, like a purple lavender, highly aromatic, like a fresh soap kind of character. I get a minty flavor, absolutely. Uh, mint, eucalyptus, kind of all of that level of aromatics that are clean and minty uh, lend itself to uh, a little bit more of the observation of, of the alcohol character. So for me, the, the wine is more, like if you gave me these two wines in a blind tasting, the, the first wine, the Dolcetto, because it's so fruity, I think may throw people off in terms of, is it from the new world or is it from the old world, okay? This wine, while is highly aromatic, it, the, the aromas are really more about the, the, the earthy character more than the fruity character. And I think it would be a little bit easier to define this as old world. Now, when we get to the palate and we taste the structure of the wine, that will confirm or deny this. But the reality is that this wine is, in terms of its fruit character on the aroma, is not nearly as uh, pronounced as the non-fruit character on the aroma. Okay, so let's give it a taste. We're tasting for dryness. The wine is dry, right? Um, this is, we're starting to create wines that give you cat tongue. Like if you put the tongue at the top of your mouth, it's gritty. You're getting situations where your gums are sticking to your teeth. Okay, more tannin, but the wine is dry. It's, it's like, there's no, it's, there is fruit because it's still a wine that's a, a, alive and well but it's not fruity. It's not anywhere near the level of fruitiness as the Dolcetto, okay? So the wine is dry. We need to taste for acid next. Again, we're paying attention to how much we salivate. Okay, in my mind, I'm comparing it to the Pinot Noirs, I'm comparing it on one level and I'm also comparing it to Chardonnay on another level. Um, the wine definitely has more acid than the Dolcetto. I would say that it's, um, I would probably not yet pull it in the same level as Cabernet Franc in terms of acid, but it's definitely more acid than a Chardonnay, more acid than uh, the Pinot Noir that we had from the New World. I wouldn't say that it has more acid than, the Pinot, than a Pinot Noir from let's say Burgundy. Um, so I would say medium, maybe medium plus acid and dry. And then in terms of tannins, the tannins are, while well, well integrated, meaning you feel them across your palate, it's even, but they are very pronounced. Uh, that is, I would say, youthful tannin. Uh, and those tannins are slightly bitter, okay? And I think that as this wine ages, those tannins are gonna soften. The bitterness is going to soften. More of that fruit will come forward. Uh, and actually, that fruit will become sweeter because as you oxidize a fruit, you get more fruitiness. That's kind of the nature of the beast. And then eventually, the wine will just fall apart and be past its prime. Okay, so we've talked about tannin. Let's talk about alcohol. Um, I, I said that Nebbiolo is a thin skinned, high acid, high tannin, high alcohol varietal. Uh, <clears throat> The reason for that is Nebbiolo in the Piedmont is typically a varietal that's harvest, harvested in uh, the first to second week of October in a normal year um, and can go anywhere between the last week of September in a non-normal year or all the way into November in an extreme year. So it's a varietal that has an extremely long growing season, potentially April to the end of October, November. As a result of that, you get ripeness of fruit, meaning higher bricks. And then therefore, when you convert that into a wine, that sugar into a wine, you get higher alcohol. 
but the wine is totally balanced out by its alcohol by the fact that it has tannin, by the fact that it has acid, and the combination of those things create a wine that has a fuller body. And so this wine, in terms of body, is it fuller body than Chardonnay? Most definitely. Is it something that I would drink after my Dolcetto? Absolutely. Is it something that I would drink before uh, a Merlot? Is a great question. Is it something that I would drink before a Cabernet Sauvignon? Yes. Um, I would actually, the, going back to the Merlot question, I would drink this wine before a Merlot because a Merlot would be both the same body as this, but not as dry, okay? And so that character of fruitiness would make that Merlot more pleasant after drinking a wine that is a little bit drier. And so while they're the same body, the same structure of the wine, in reality, um, the dryness of the Nebbiolo would uh, make that wine be the wine that you would want to drink first. I got a mint, okay, same question. <clears throat> All right, guys, how are we feeling so far? Wines are good, wines are really good. Let me pull up the text sheet for your Nebbiolo. Okay, again, I'm not so concerned about the kind of the, the climate, the soil type. Uh, the thing that's important for me right now in the text sheet, obviously Nebbiolo, it's 100% Nebbiolo. Uh, you can see the harvest time, first week of October. Production, soft pressed and stainless steel fermentation or fermented with a maceration of eight days. So they basically are fermenting and macerating at the same time. Um, classic, it's no problem. That's eight to nine days is very normal for most growing regions. That's nothing extreme there. Nothing says, wow, that's a really special wine. That's just an, uh, an average production cycle. Aging after alcohol and malactive fermentation, the wine is aged in Allier oak, which is a French oak for 12 months. Cool environment at a constant cool environment. There you go. Uh, ruby red, orange hues, everything we've talked about. Intense and delicate with notes of violet, underbrush, and spices, everything we've talked about. The wine is dry, it's harmonious, and appropriately tannic. I love that description because it's supposed to be tannic, but it's appropriately tannic. Um, and then obviously some pairing dishes, and then what to serve it at. Um, again, this wine should be slightly chill when you drink them. They should be cold, but there should be a chill. If the wines are not chilled, and you're drinking them at room temperature, you're tasting way more tannin and way more alcohol than the rest of us. Okay, let me stop sharing. Here we go, that goes away. And then here's what Wine Folly has to say about, nope, that's the map. Here's what Wine Folly has to say. Nope, 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 we'll get there. Here we go. Primary flavors for Nebbiolo. Cherry, rose, leather, anise, clay pot. You know, um, if you have a clay pot, you should just hurry up and run out and go smell it. <laughs> the wine is bone dry, super dry, right? This, is, this level of dryness is the same level of dryness as our Chinon Cab Franc. Uh, same level of dryness as you would get from a Pinot Noir. Uh, an old world Pinot Noir. New world Pinot Noirs are not this dry. Same level of dryness as a Sangiovese or a Tempranillo. Again, I'm, I'm thinking in the, of the classical sense, the old world sense. So Tuscan, Chianti, Chianti Classicos, or Rioja, or Ribera del Duero, those levels of Tempranillo are all considered dry to bone dry. Um, as you move these wines into a new world or into a warmer climate, they get richer, meaning they both increase body and they also increase uh, or decrease the level of dryness, meaning they become more fruity, okay? Medium to full bodied, as we described it, super high tannin. Nebbiolo is on its own, probably one of the most tannic varietals out there. It's a wine that lends itself to extreme amount of aging at the top level. Uh, medium high acid, super high acid, and then the high alcohol. I mean, it's very rarely, um, let's see, this wine, in terms of your alcohol content, is 14.5%, okay? 
it's very common to get Nebbiolos above 14%. So they, they're also perfect for dates. I don't, I'm not condoning anything, <laughs> any bad behavior. I'm just saying that they make people happy. <laughs> All right, friends. So keep sipping and swirling and tasting, and then uh, we're gonna kind of go into the next topic. I'll pull up the agenda so you kind of know where we are. So we've kind of talked about the structure of these two wines. Now you kind of have an appreciation of what you're tasting. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna go down this rabbit hole of how Italian wines are labeled and when we talked about France and when you talk about really every other country in the EU, these are places that are really geared towards the name of the place becomes the wine. And the question then becomes, how do I know what I'm drinking if I don't know what, where that place is? Um, the reality is, is because the name of the place defines the wine. If you know the name of that, if you know the rules of that place, you know how that wine is produced, you know the grapes involved, you know uh, when, uh, how they can be blended, when they can be harvested, when they can be released, all that minutia of detail. In Italy, they have the same thing, except they took it one step further and they said that not only is the name of the place that is what defines the wine, and they gave that a classification, in Italy, they also allowed for the name of a grape from a place to be called a thing, and therefore it has its own classification. And, and in that world, we amplify the number of classified wines in Italy. So when we look at the very top layer of classified wines, which are wines from a protected origin, there are over 1,400 wines of a protected origin in Italy. That doesn't include regional wines. It doesn't include table wines. These are kind of the top tier wines known in Italy as the DOC and the DOCG, okay? And while if you look at just the, the, the number of actual physical pieces of land that are known as a DOC or a DOCG, it's in the 400s or so, but then when you actually add the grapes that are within those 400 or so DOC, DOCGs, you end up getting the number of classified wines to be well over 1,300, almost 1,400 different classified wines in Italy, okay? And therefore, that number of wines can be labeled in a, an, a, an array of different ways. And that's kind of one of the things that I wanted to talk about. I mean, while it's nice to have a deep dive into Piedmont, the reality is it's also nice to understand when you go out and buy these wines, what it is that you could possibly be buying so you know that you're getting uh, the wine from the place that you want and also from the grape that you want, okay? So take a taste. We're going to keep, keep going. Okay, so let's, we're going to create a list. I did not put this on the screen. If for those of you that are liking to take notes, feel free to obviously take notes. Um, for those of you that are not taking notes and you want this writ written out, um, I can definitely do that. But I did not put this on the screen, so I'll just talk. Okay, so the first way a wine can be labeled in Italy is simply by the name of its place. Okay, and we're going to talk about P the Piemonte today, which is, for example, the, the town of Borolo or the town of Barbaresco. The wine is named after the place. Therefore, it dictates what that wine can be and how that wine is produced. So the first and the most simple is a wine that's named after its place. So when you go to the store, if you want to buy a Barolo, you go and buy a Barolo. Everyone knows what a Barolo is. They're going to give you 100% Nebbiolo wine from the village of Barolo. Okay. The second way a wine can be named is a place name plus a grape name. Okay. And one of the, the simple categories here, let me pull up this label here, is actually the wine that you're drinking. And I, you know, I, I would have used that as the example, but I didn't. So you are drinking a Lange Nebbiolo. 
a place name plus a grape name. And Lange is one of your DOC, it's a classified growing area. So a place name plus a grape name, okay? Another way a wine can be labeled is essentially the opposite of that, which is a grape plus a place. And which is your first wine, your Dolcetto de Alba. Your Dolcetto de Alba, here we go, there we go, okay. Dolcetto de Alba, grape Dolcetto of Alba, Alba the town. So a grape plus a place. The next way a wine can be labeled is by a style and God bless the Italians and their styles. Um, Italy is the only place that has created wines that are really based on this idea of a style. What is a style you ask? A style can mean many different things. Um, we can go from the vineyard forward, which is really where it starts. In one of the classes, we talk about the difference between monoculture and polyculture. Polyculture being a field blend. I have a field that's planted with whatever number of grapes at what number, number of percentage. And in a single harvest, I will harvest all of those grapes at one time. All of those grapes will go into a press at one time. I will ferment all of those grapes at one time and produce a wine that is entirely unique to that field in which those grapes are harvested in. That is the kind of the quintessential definition of a style. It's a style that's unique to that place based off of the composition of that vineyard, okay? Um, other styles include very old styles that were actually brought to Italy by the Greeks and the Phoenicians and then obviously the then Romans, which include all the range of sweet styles of wines being produced in Italy, um, which include things like Vinsanto, include things like uh, Pasitos and Amarones and Recciotos. Uh, these are all styles of wine based off of how grapes are treated in the vineyard or what happens to those grapes after they are harvested. And so things like Prosecco um, is a, probably the most common, even though it's not the most famous. Prosecco is literally a sparkling wine that is sparkling and dry. Secco being the style, secco meaning dry. Um, another one could be, the, the, my example is uh, from a, again, I'm going back to this idea of, of a style plus a place is the most famous style plus a place, which is Emerone della Valpolicella. So Emerone being a style that's entirely unique to the village of Valpolicella. That doesn't tell you the name of the grape. What it does is it tells you the name of the style, okay? And so while that idea is very much a classic traditional Italian idea, it is not really a model that you see in Piedmont. And when we talk about Piedmont, it really is the French wine region of Italy. It's very French in its approach in terms of production. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but we rarely see, and actually I couldn't even find an example of a style plus a place uh, from the Piemonte. So typically that is something that's reserved for a little bit more uh, traditional or classic Italian wine production regions that are really geared towards polyculture than they are monoculture, okay? And then the last way a wine can be labeled. Okay, I'm gonna come back and answer Sarah's question here in a second. <clears throat> the last way a wine can be labeled is by a place plus a style. <laughs> to make things even more freaking confusing. A place plus a style. This is your, the best example of this would be like Asti Spumanti. Asti being the name of the town, Spumante meaning sparkling wine. Okay, so it's a sparkling wine from the village or the town of Asti, okay? Uh, Asti is technically, while it's a town, it's also the, um, uh, um, there's a, a province. I mean, there's an area around the actual village of Asti that we know as Asti. And so it's, it, it doesn't necessarily have to come from within that village, but really that area. Okay, so let me go back and answer Sarah's question or Sally's question. 
She's asking basically, I thought DOC was the net was not a place, but production process and standards. It's both. So the, the place defines what, how it can be produced and in what form it can be produced and out of what it can be produced from. Okay. So it, it, the answer is you're correct, but the, 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 the place defines production. You guys doing okay? Let's move on. Okay, I'm gonna drop this agenda and let's pick up the map. And again, if I need to screen share this to make it bigger, it's no problem. Um, I actually, while we teach obviously about Piedmont and the guild classes, we teach it in segments. And so we, the maps that I use are actually divided into really the, the six provinces of of Piedmont, it really wasn't a comprehensive map. So I actually pulled this map from another wine school called the Society of Wine Educators. Uh, that's the school that does the WSET. So if some of you that are studying for WSET, this map may be, uh, may be something that looks familiar. Please screen share. Okay. All right, does that look good? Fills the screen, okay. Okay, so we're gonna look at Piedmont at a very high level. And then we're going to talk about the varietals. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about the terroir, the climate, the things that make it unique. Um, and then we're going to basically talk about the varietals, the key varietals. And then we'll talk about some of the cultural cuisine things that make it a, a unique place. Okay, so first and foremost, when we talk about Piedmont, the word actually means the foot of the mountain. Pied, foot, mount, or mont, mountain. The question is, is what mountains are we talking about? And this is really your, your, your first uh, Tawar element, the, the geographical component that really defines the region, which is the two mountain ranges, the Alps to the north and the Apennine Mountains, both to the south and to the east of the growing area. So I'm in, uh, you have a picture of Italy up here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. You can see the outline of the Piemonte in red and basically the French Alps and the Italian Alps, French Alps to the west, the Italian Alps to the north, same mountain range, but it goes basically across the northern part of Italy. And then you have the Apennines. The Apennines basically is what creates this division between the Piedmont and the Mediterranean. So basically the Apennines is a region that is just to the north of the Val d'Aosta, this boomerang looking shaped region. And so basically it comes over here, it's on the eastern edge of Piedmont, and then it goes down through the south, uh, the central part, all the way from north to south of Italy, okay? So two mountain ranges. What's unique about these mountain ranges is that the, the Apennine Mountains actually block the influence of the Mediterranean from being from influencing Piedmont. And so what we really end up having is a true continental climate of the region, meaning four seasons, warm summers, nice falls, super cold winters, nice springs, and you get the true four seasons, okay? Th what ends up happening because of the French Alps is the French, or excuse me, the Italian Alps, the Italian Alps actually block the, the super cold Arctic air from coming into the Piedmont. And so we actually get, um, I, I can't say a warmer region, but we actually get a region that isn't as cold as the, the, the part of, let's say Switzerland or the other part of the Alps um, that are further north of it, okay? And in reality, we have to think of Piedmont as this kind of tug of war region. There's a tug of war between the Italian Alps and the, the, the Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean wants to basically uh, add moisture, add, add warmth. The Italian Alps want to add coolness. And what ends up happening is we have a smashing together of these two extreme climates that produce a fog. And actually the fog um, is, is, is what the word or the grape Nebbiolo is named after. Nebbiolo uh, classically is uh, uh, a Greek word that uh, is uh, um, the root is basically nebbia, and nebbia being 
the Greek word for, for fog. And so the region is very uh, pronounced with fog during the growing season. And so I'm gonna come back to this thought uh, here in a moment. But the other thing that as a result of these mountains it, are the foothills of the mountains. And so while the Italian Alps are more extreme, um, we also have the Apennine foothills. And so it is on the foothills where the growing areas exist, okay? So I'm gonna pull up some pictures here and maybe I can put them on the same screen so we can see them. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Okay, so here's two pictures. And let me see if I can arrange this on the screen so we can see all of it. Let me put this here. Let me put this here. Okay. All right, you guys, so here's the situation. The picture on the left is a picture taken from um, a region called the Manfrato, known as the Manfrato Hills. And Manfrato, in terms of the map, includes the provinces of Asti here, and Alessandria here kind of in the southeast. So these two provinces and the other four provinces include the most famous Cuneo, uh, Turin where the capital is. Uh, we also have Vercelli and then Navarra. Super cold, no grapes are grown there, okay? So six provinces. The, 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 the provinces known as Asti and Alessandria are known as the Manforato Hills. And this is a picture looking north I'm over here at this point, the top left picture. You can see the Italian Alps, and you can see that there is a village on top of the hill, and all the vineyards are basically beneath the village and facing south, okay? And then the other picture, there's a lot going on here. I don't know if you see my chat. Let me see if I can get rid of that. <clears throat> Okay, the next picture here is a picture of Barolo, the most famous village. And this is what is known as the Lange Hills, so the hills of the Lange. And the Lange is the, is the growing area that, can, can, that contains the most famous province, which is the Cuneo. So the Cuneo is, here's the Po River. The Po River is a super famous, it's the longest river in Italy. It's the only river that goes across the entire country from west to east. It basically goes from the, the Italian, French, Swiss border all the way to basically the Adriatic. And it cuts right through the, the, Pied, the Piemonte, okay? There's obviously other rivers, most famously the Torino River, or the, excuse me, the Tanaro River uh, that cuts through the most famous districts. But here's a picture taken of Barolo, you can see that Barolo is the dark blue-ish area. Again, if you look at the picture, what I know and what I'm gonna tell you is that the, the most important vineyards are all facing south. So this is a vineyard, uh, excuse me, um, an image where the south facing vineyards are going from the left side of the picture to the right side of the picture. And so in, re in reality, what we are looking at is east. And you can see in the background here, this is the, um, the, the, the less extreme Apennine mountain range, okay? And all the vineyards are facing south or southeast, and that's how it works. So what ends up happening is because we have this clashing of, of super cold air coming from the Italian Alps, and warmer air trying to come into the interior part of the region from the Mediterranean, we produce a fog during the growing season, okay? And it's because of that fog, we have a very unique situation in terms of uh, overall structure of a wine. Um, it's also the name of where we get the term Nebbiolo from. So that's the condition during the growing season. In the winter, what ends up happening is uh, the, it's a cold continental climate, so the region gets snow. And so all these vineyards are covered with snow. Uh, if you Google winter in Piedmont, you'll see probably a picture of 
snow-covered vineyards. But what's super unique, both in terms of the snow cover and of the fog, is that the vineyards that sit above the fog and the vineyards that are on the top of the hills are the regions that warm the quickest after winter and enter spring sooner. And those are the most prized vineyards. So the vineyards that are above the fog line is one condition. And then those vineyards that literally where the snow melts the first in the winter is the, is the next most prized vineyards of the region, okay? And when I say that this is um, uh, a very French-like region, what I really mean by that, it's, it's really the only Italian place, Italian region that has identified the, the particular location within the region that is producing a better quality wine than regions around it. And what they end up doing is they call these wines Sori's, S-O-R-I's. So let me, let me, I'll come back to my screen share here in a minute. But what I wanted to kind of point to here, let me go back to my agenda. Okay, I said, uh, where is it at? Um, under to our considerations, we have geography, soil, climate, provinces, and sorry, not sorry. Uh, a sorry is essentially a named vineyard. It's a, it's a crew. So it's a vineyard with a unique exposition that it was named. And so on a bottle of wine, if you see a named vineyard on your label, that's one thing. It's a prized spot that they've given a name to. We call them sorry. So the term sorry is, is basically the same term as the word crew. I'm having Texas barbecue pork ribs for dinner. Which one pairs better to heavy sauce? Definitely the Dolcetto. No sauce. No sauce. No heavy, no sauce. Oh, uh, one pair. Uh, that's a great question. I would probably then go to the Nebbiolo because if it's a smoky, and it has char, that's all kind of very similar to the characteristic of a Nebbiolo. Tar-like, fuller-bodied. Um, if it's pork, the, the Nebbiolo has high acid and tannin and I call to kind of cut some of that fat of the pork. Um, good question. Okay, so let me go back to the screen share. So many windows open. I'm gonna close my chat. Here's the map of Piedmont. So it should be a clean screen at this point with just the map of the Piemonte. If you're sitting outside, kudos to you because the weather is truly exceptional today. Okay, so we talked about a little bit of the geography, the two mountain ranges. Of, the, of all the regions in, in the Piedmont, the Gavi region, which is a, one of your only DOCG top, top the most top of the line, <laughs> sounds like a, the difference between a Lexus and a, and a Toyota, um, the, the, the top tier growing area, the Gavi DOCG, is really the, the only region within the, the Piemonte that actually on some level feels the influence of the Mediterranean. And that they're known for a white wine out of a grape called Cortese. Uh, Cortese is uh, a high acid, light body white wine, but it tends to have a little bit more of a fresher, not as austere, not nearly as bitter uh, lime citrus character as some of the other more famous white wines like uh, Raro uh, DOCG, um, I guess uh, another DOCG white from a grape called uh, Arnais. Um, so let's talk about climate, or excuse me, soil for a moment. We mentioned that the climate was continental, so it's a cold continental climate. Classic soils of the Piedmont are, are car calcareous marl. Uh, and marl is basically a calcium carbonate type of soil. So we're looking at uh, calcium-based soils that uh, are kind of intermingled with different types of sandstone. And sandstone is literally uh, compressed 
elements of sand that are under pressure over time that they become really stuck together. And because of weathering and rain and washout, the most types of the most common types of sandstone are sandstones that are made out of quartz and really feldspar. And so that's kind of the classic kind of sedimentary rock is really sandstone. And then we also have an intermingling of clay, or excuse me, yeah, clay and sand. And so particularly for regions like Barolo and Barbaresco, it's that sand and sandstone type of soil that really makes the wines super finesse, finesse a lot of complexity, nothing is, is super fruity or over the top in terms of, of, of um, um, just richness. They tend to be a little bit leaner, but sand soils tend to both create complexity and a unique situation where they are phylloxera resistant. So the sandy soils of the world are really those soils that have the opportunity to be phylloxera. Um, the reason why phylloxera is not necessarily a, a great, uh, or excuse me, sand soils are not really a great combination for phylloxera is, is kind of the best example I can give is, is like why we use diatomaceous earth for insecticide. It's such a fine particle that it gets into the joints of an insect and it basically prevents them from moving and eventually it'll kill them. Um, it basically slices and dices them in many, many different ways, okay? So it's a, it's a unique place, Brolo, kind of this Alba, the Cuneo region or province is definitely more sandy. As you go from, let's say, west to east across the region, you tend to get a little bit more limestone um, and a little bit more clay, but it's not an extreme change. It's just as you move into kind of the more Apennine direction, you get a little bit more clay type of soils with a little bit more limestone. Okay, so we talked about the provinces. Again, Cuneo, your most famous, known as the Lange, which is what you're drinking. You're drinking a Nebbiolo from the Lange, which is its own classified growing area. The other most famous growing area is what consists of both Asti and Alessandria, which is the Manfrato Hills. Um, and then the other regions are really minor. Typically, as you move north, you get closer to the Alps, you become much colder, and therefore the wines become a lot more austere, higher acid, not nearly as fruity, not nearly as much body, and therefore are either very fresh wines that you need to drink while they're young, particularly for like white wines like Herbaluce, which we'll talk about Herbaluce briefly, um, which is a white wine that's coming from in and around Turin or Torino. Um, uh, Frise, another one, is super cool climate. Uh, kind of like a Nebbiolo, but typically you see it slightly sparkling, slightly sweet. We're gonna talk about these varietals here in a moment, but I'm just trying to give you an, a, an idea that as you move further north, your wine types become um, less approachable. Uh, either they become super high in acid, uh, or they tend to lose body and become bitter and green and therefore need a, quite a bit of age. There is one exception, um, which is Gatanara, and Gatanara is now, and, and Gimme, you know, like give me the wine. Those two DOCGs for Nebbiolo are highly prized while they tend to be, let's say better values, which is not really saying a whole lot when you come to Nebbiolo, better values than, Bar than Barolos and Barbarescos further south. They are totally different in terms of their style. They're leaner, they're meaner, slightly greener. Um, but they are, are really excellent wines and with age they become quite phenomenal. Okay, so a couple of other things related to the Piedmont. Um, so I mentioned the Po River. The Po River is the longest river in Italy. Um, in terms of how Piedmont fits within the rest of uh, Italy, it, um, you know, if we look at total production, I'm, the Veneto is the number one producing region uh, in all of Italy. <laughs> and Piedmont, um, to kind of give you an idea, Piedmont is the sixth highest producing region. It has about 45,000 hectares. So again, if we, let's multiply 45,000 times 2.47 acres per hectare, 111,000 acres within the Piemonte. So tons of, I mean, I, I, uh, Craig sent me yesterday or the day before kind of the, the current numbers for Texas, which was less than 5,200 acres planted, <laughs> you know, so the, the, 
the numbers are staggering when you talk about European wines in general. Um, of the, of, if you look at the region as a whole, there's 59 growing areas. Um, they're obviously Barolo being the most prominent and the most famous. And then we're gonna start to break this down by varietal. So uh, if there's no questions, let's kind of move this forward to kind of grapes. And I will, I'll, I'll stop the shared screen, but I'll reference it as we need to. That way it's not just a static image the entire time. So let's do this. Let me get rid of this. Map, here we go, map. Hope you guys are drinking wine. Close all these images. Okay. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about varietals. There's obviously three main varietals, Nebbiolo being the most important, then there's Dolcetto, and then there's Barbera, okay? So uh, let's kind of take this from a growing area perspective, and then we'll talk about the varietals themselves, and then we'll move on to uh, the white wine areas. Because it's a region that produces mostly red wine, um, I'm, I'll spend most of the time talking about red wines. Okay, so I mentioned in the comment earlier that in Italy they can name the growing area based off of the place. And so when we uh, name of the place, and then when they can also name the growing area based off of the grape name. And so what ends up happening, you need me, wine? Yeah. Uh, what ends up happening is within a, let's say a particular province, let's talk about Cuneo. Um, there, are, there are a number of different uh, classified wine types for that one grape um, in that growing area, okay? So let's, let me give you some examples or let me give you uh, the exact numbers. So when we talk about the grape Barbera, Barbera is um, the most planted red grape in all of the Piedmont. It is a wine that while has uh, very um, um, soft and fruity character. It is a wine that typically has um, very light tannin, but very pronounced acid. And so when we get to our food and wine pairing, it's kind of the, the go-to red wine, excuse me, it's the go-to red wine for food, particularly food that includes things like charcuterie, because it has really beautiful acid, soft tannin, so it really cuts through the types of, of, of meats and cheeses that are being produced within the Piedmont, okay? So um, the, the varietal Barbera itself has nine different DOC or DOCGs. Uh, really, there are three DOCGs and there are um, six uh, DOCs, so nine total protected areas that can produce a wine that is known for Barbera. Okay, that's one example. As we kind of move up, we're gonna get more extreme. So Dolcetto, the Dolcetto that, just like the wine we're drinking, Dolcetto has 10 DOC or DOCGs. So in reality, there are three DOCGs and there are seven DOCs, um, making it, there are, again, more growing areas that produce a wine out of Dolcetto that are classified at the highest level. And then Nebbiolo, let me kick Nacho. Um, Nebbiolo being kind of the extreme. Nebbiolo has 13 different growing areas that are known for producing Nebbiolo. Of those 13, five of them are known as DOCG. So the, the highest of the high in terms of their classification. Okay, so let's briefly run down some of these key grapes. We talked about Barbera. Barbera is a uh, kind, of, I, I, kind of the analogy to this would be Barbera is the Merlot of the Piedmont. Um, it is soft in terms of tannin, it has acid, uh, it's fruity, it kind of is very similar to Dolcetto except it's, it's the opposite in terms of structure in the sense that Dolcetto tends to have um, more, uh, no acid and slightly softer, chewier, uh, riper tannin, whereas Barbera is kind of the opposite of that. Barbera tends to have acid and no tannin, 
okay? Uh, in terms of the fruit profile, dolcetto is known as the little sweet one. So the fruit is, is more purple, more plummy, more fruity. Barbera being uh, a little bit more of a, a red berry fruit than it is kind of a purple blackberry fruit like we got in the dolcetto. In terms of how they behave in the vineyard, uh, dolcetto is typically always harvested first, then it's Barbera, and then it's Nebbiolo. Nebbiolo being the longest in terms of when it's harvested, and that being the grape that is thinner skinned, high acid, high tannin, high alcohol, uh, and also the longest lived that's harvested mid uh, to late October, if not into November. Um, in terms of Nebbiolo, because it is the most important varietal of the Piemonte, it is, let's talk about things that compare to it that are not Italian or um, not from the Piedmont, which if in a blind tasting, you are trying to uh, really test yourself, the, the parallels or the laterals to uh, Nebbiolo include Sangiovese, include Pinot Noir, include Tempranillo. Um, so if you got those four grapes side by side, uh, same quality level, which is really, if you don't know quality level, same price point, um, then those are going to be wines that in a blind tasting are going to be very, very confusing because they all tend to be thin skinned, high acid, high tannin. Nebbiolo's what's unique in the sense that it's also high in alcohol. Okay. And so if you're able to see those four varietals side by side, that's really where you have to understand that nuance of structure uh, plays a major role in uh, a blind tasting. Okay. So those are your three big varietals. Make sure I'm covering everything there. Yeah. Your big three varietals. And then you have kind of minor varietals and minor red varietals include Brachetto. Brachetto is a awesome wine. It's like, it's, it's a slightly rosé, reddish wine, slightly sparkling, slightly sweet. It's the perfect wine for milk chocolate. And I will write that up here because it's definitely worth seeking out. Now I'm hungry. Okay, Brachetto. Here's Brachetto. I put that in the chat. So that's Brachetto, slightly, slightly reddish, darker pink, sparkling wine, slightly sweet. Really a, an awesome wine for milk chocolate desserts. Okay, um, then we have Frise. Frise, I'll type that out too. Frise or Frisa, depending on how you want to say it. Um, very similar to Nebbiolo, kind of austere, high in acid, can be high in tannin but it makes a, light, a lighter bodied red wine that you typically see as slightly sparkling. For me, this would be like the, um, the Lambrusco of the Piemonte. It can be dry really great with char charcuterie. Okay, then we have uh, Grignolino. Grignolino. Um, very similar to Frise, a little bit more fruity. Still sparkling, can be dry or off dry, uh, but a little bit more fruity than the Frise. Also very good with, uh, with charcuterie and, and kind of soft ripened cheeses and things like that. Okay, and the one that may be confusing, Malvasia. I know I'm, I'm hearing Henry Croson in my head, which is, he likes to say Malvasia. Mal, how to, Malvasia. Okay, while we know Malvasia as a white grape, it, there are definitely mutations that produce a red wine. And so these are producing still sweet reds, okay? Super pleasant, very high in acid, highly aromatic red wines. All right. <clears throat> so let's go to whites. The most important varietals for white wines and the Piemonte, one is your Cortese and your Aranese. Aranese and Cortese are the only two DOCG white wines. Cortese being um, a little bit of a riper style of white wine, still both light, medium, high in acid, very citrus dominant, but you also get a little bit more of a, a melon, a gooseberry, a little bit more of kind of an austere, underripe, white strawberry, kind of high acid, bitter 
kind of dirty buried fruit. Um, and that would kind of be your classic example of agave um, or corteze, agave being the village of where corteze comes from. RNAs is a little bit more tropical. Um, same body, light, medium bodied, high acid, dry, very pleasant white wines. If you're looking for uh, uh, something different than a Pinot Grigio, then I would go Cortese. You can buy it as Gavi, Gavi being the name of the village, or you can buy it as Rero or RNAs from the village of Rero. So two common high acid, light bodied um, white wines that are equivalent to a Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, uh, Grunerveld, Liener, things of those nature. So if you're looking to branch out, those would be kind of your, your comparison. Um, then we have probably the most famous Moscato, which is known as Moscato Bianco, also known as uh, Muscat Blanc and Petit Grand, which is white Muscat with small seeds, which is the most common type of Muscat that you see from Moscato d'Asti. So it's non-bitter, not nearly as aromatic as orange Muscat. Um, and so it's just a, a lighter, more, more honeydew melon, honeysuckle, orange zest, soft, slightly sparkling, slightly sweet, very complex, super pleasant wine that um, is really a great dessert wine, but man, it's so refreshing because of the acid that you could just drink that by itself and be very happy on its own. Um, other grapes, Chardonnay, of course, is kind of these international varietals that has found its way into, into Piedmont. Uh, again, it's a French it's, you know, I never really talked much about the history of the Piedmont. Um, this is, I guess, a good opportunity to do that. But it is a, a French region in Italy in the sense of both monoculture and its history. And its history is basically that the Piedmont became what it is today because of a royal family from France, uh, from the region of Savoy, which is an Alpine region on the French and Switzerland border that over time through marriage, through diplomacy, would accumulate and expand its wealth, its territory, its power, to the point that it would become a kingdom. And its kingdom would, would reign over parts of Italy, including the islands of Sicily, the islands of Sardinia, and eventually Piedmont. And so when we talk about um, the unification of Italy as a country in the 1860s, the late uh, or the mid to late 19th century. Um, when we talk about the people that were involved in that, all the way through really the First World War going into the Second World War, all of that, the king and the, the nobility of the unified Italy for that really, uh, let's call it 85 to 90 years, is a noble family from France, not a noble family or an Italian diplomat. It is a uh, unique history, what's happening in the Piedmont, which is uh, incredibly French influenced, both in terms of its cuisine, which I do want to talk about, but also that has implications on the wine. Okay, so briefly, white varietals. The other two white varietals to mention are Herba Luce. Herba Luce is like the Muscadet of, the, of Italy. It's a super light bodied, super high acid, really incredible with shellfish, okay? Uh, and also freshwater fish. Uh, okay, and then the last varietal to mention, just because it has uh, a unique place that we all have familiarity with, I think, at least in Texas, is the grape Favorita. Favorita is the grape Vermentino, okay? So we do see some of this uh, southern Italian influence coming through into northern Italy, uh, mainly because of the, the location of where Piedmont is compared to Tuscany, really where Vermentino is a, a major white varietal. Okay, so let's briefly talk about cuisine, and then we'll wrap up. So when we talk about um, in general terms, the Piedmont is, is not nearly as Southern. When we think of Southern Italy, we think of olives and tomatoes. Piedmont kind of leaves those types of ingredients behind and replaces them with things like cream and butter, right? 
which is incredibly delicious and also very French-like. So when we talk about the cuisine of Piedmont, it is more rich, more layered uh, than the cuisine of Central and Southern Italy, which is a little bit more simple, really based off of the ingredient versus technique. Um, and again, so kind of lending itself uh, back to this idea of this French influence. Okay, the, the, the character of the fruit is very earthy. Uh, we think of things like um, truffles and porcini mushrooms and hazelnuts and um, all the kind of herb rooted herb vegetables um, that are unique to a condition that is like the Piedmont. Um, it is in Alba where every year they have the truffle festival, which is obviously a, a, a super big deal. And when I talk about truffles, what I really mean is white truffles. It's not until you get to really the Rhone Valley, Southern Rhone Valley in France, where we start talking about black truffles. And so we really are talking about things that are very highly aromatic, very intense in terms of flavor that require a lot of complexity. You had cream and butter and the most famous type of pasta coming out of the Piemonte, which is known as tahirine, um, which is kind of like a tagliatelle, way skinnier uh, and long like a spaghetti, okay? Uh, super classic egg yolk pasta um, that is just very famous for the region. Um, the other things to know about the Piemonte is it's the home of hazelnuts. The most famous hazelnut product coming out of the Piedmont is Nutella. Nutella is based in the Piedmont, okay? So very classic pairings, which is why Brocchetto exists. Brocchetto really is that classic pairing of chocolate and hazelnut, slightly sweet. It's not, it's not as sweet as some chocolates. It's also got a nutty character. It's just literally the most perfect pairing. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to finish with with food and wine pairing is both, I wanted to talk about the pairings for the three most common red varietals, Nebbiolo, Barbera, Dolcetto, um, and then some of the cheeses, most of which you can buy. I bought most of these here in the States over the last few years. But the most famous cheese is probably something that you may have in your kitchen right now, which is Gorgonzola. And there's a range of Gorgonzola. Gorgonzola as a cheese actually is originating from the region next to the Piemonte, which is the Lombardy region. Uh, but because those regions sh are so close, the influence is obviously there. So you do see really quite a bit of Gorgonzola that is from the Piemonte here in the States in terms of going to Central Market and finding cheese. Um, the other really famous cheese that you can find here is uh, a cheese called Tomino. Tomino is like the Italian version of a, of a brie. And it's a soft ripened cheese. It's sweet. It's creamy, fresh. It's just a really pleasant cheese. Um, the other famous cheese which you can buy is a cheese called Crouton. And Crouton is a kind of a semi-firm cheese, but in the middle of it, it has black uh, truffles mixed within it. So it's, it's, it's texturally rich. It's got very rich and full-bodied flavor. It's like the perfect cheese for uh, Nebbiolo if you're not going the kind of the blue vein Gorgonzola uh, route. Okay, and then classic pairings for Nebbiolo. Um, it is a, a wine, again, high acid, high tannin, and high alcohol. It needs things that pair to that level of intensity. Things like uh, rich risottos, like squid ink risotto, awesome pairing for Nebbiolos. Um, buttery egg noodles, like the classic uh, tahirine. Um, woodsy flavors like mushrooms and thyme and comp that are complex and kind of stewed over time that create uh, another layer of complexity, braised boar, pork and beef dishes, and anything that has truffles is perfect. Like truffle fries with Nebbiolo, God help me, is probably one of the best things I've ever put in my mouth. Back to the labels a bit, it's annoying. They don't mention, I'm reading, uh, oh, okay. It's annoying they don't mention Piedmont on the label. Is there a trick to knowing the area of Italy other than memorizing geography? Ooh, mm. yeah, so I'm taking a little side step here. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately it sucks. Okay, the, let's go back to the, let's go back to the labels here. Technically, let me get, 
Okay, technically this is the front label. This is the back label, okay? Nowhere on this label does it say it's from Piedmont. Again, let's go to the Dolcetto. Technically, where we are, okay, technically, that is the front label, and this is the back label. And nowhere on this label does it say Piedmont. It says, okay, we have Alba, we have Alba here, we have, it says Barbaresco down here, it says Italy down here. No idea that it says, I don't know where Piedmont is, it doesn't say. Um, it's not common because the place defines the wine and most producers are super small. They're not very large producers. So marketability is not necessarily, um, they don't understand the American market, a lot of it. So it's really up to the, the, the buyer um, and the seller. So if you were to go to HEB and buy this wine, I, I'm pretty sure on some level there's going to be a shelf talker or it may be even on the label that it says Piedmont. But if you're buying wines from a local wine shop or most restaurants that are trying to source wines that you can't get pretty much anywhere else in terms of retail, then those are wines that are meant to be hand sold. And so probably not. They're looking for smaller producers that are more committed to the craft of production than they are for marketability. And I, that's kind of a convoluted answer. But, but in reality, small producers don't know how the market works. And their importers are really there to find the best wine. And over time, they can kind of coach them to into what needs to be on their label but initially it's a it's a total crap sheet you got to know the regions yes nebbiolo west's question is nebbiolo only from the piedmont the question the answer is yes nebbiolo the piedmont is the home of nebbiolo what is that italian varietals grow so well why is it that okay i guess you got to you can't generalize Italian varietals. Um, is it, we're talking about Central Italy, Southern Italy, Northeast or Northwest. The one varietal that I find to be very confusing for Texas is that Dolcetto does very well in Texas, it seems like. Um, and I think part of that is, is that it doesn't require nearly as long of a growing season as Barbera or Nebbiolo. It, it's not a varietal that is meant to have a lot of structure or body to it. And so you're really looking, it's even in, even in the Piedmont, Dolcetto is a grape that's all about the fruit and the fruitiness of that fruit. I think that's a grape that lends itself to any region because if the, if the whole point is to make a wine that's all about the fruit, then you don't really need the, the climate and it can still be correct. I don't need a, a Dolcetto again is, is low in acid, low, chewy, soft, sweet tannin. Um, you can produce that level of structure in a, in a different climate without having to be in the foothills of the Alps. And so I feel like Dolcetto is one exception. And for me, the other exception would be Matapuciano. Obviously, Sangiovese, Alianico, Matapuciano. Uh, Texas Dolcetto tends to be more fruit forward, yes? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the problem with, with Texas Dolcetto, in my opinion, or it's not a problem, it's just a trait, is that the fruit character is, is divergent from plummy purple fruit into more of a strawberry fruit, strawberry raspberry. So the fruit is a little bit more red. Um, and so you don't get the concentration of, of a flavor that you are getting from, from Piedmont, just because of the, the length of the growing season. But in terms of ripeness, you're still getting the same level of ripeness and the same level of fruitiness, it's just that because of the length of the growing season, that red fruit has now turned into blue and black fruit. Awesome questions. Okay, and then uh, let's see. Classic pairings for Dolcetto. For me, pork. I love pork with Dolcetto. It's soft, um, it's, it's kind of sweet in its own way, but any lighter meat or game. So quail, pork, uh, venison, uh, even though venison may be slightly gamey, um, kind of lighter, lighter meats. Um, and then for Barbera, again, Barbera is the wine that has a little bit more red fruit than purple and black fruit compared to the Dolcetto. It has higher acid than the Dolcetto. It is this beautiful complement to charcuterie. Think of salamis, think of prosciutto, tapiocola, 
um, and then uh, kind of a range of cheeses. You guys have done so well. Cheers to y'all. I really appreciate your attendance over the last six classes, if you participated in all six, or even if this is your first class. Um, it's, uh, it's been quite humbling to know that education is this important to this many people. And uh, this is something that because of COVID, we just, we knew we had to do something. And so kind of on a whim, we said, let's create some virtual classes. And it's been really exciting to see kind of the, 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 the level of interest that people are having in wine education, so much to the point where we, we feel compelled to continue. And where that's going to go is I, I wanted to kind of share our thoughts. If you have a, uh, your own thoughts, please give us your feedback. We know that can, doing two wine classes a week at 4 o'clock in the 4 p.m. in the middle of the day is not realistic for when we all kind of hopefully get back to reality. So we want to uh, find a, um, a day and a time that makes the most sense we know that people have families, you gotta cook dinner, you gotta kinda of get your life back together after work from driving and all that. So the kind of the time that we have kind of pinpointed is 7 p.m., uh, meaning that on the day that we have a class, hopefully you have two bottles of wine, you can make a meal, have a dinner, get, uh, get a little bit um, lubricated, <laughs> fortified, and, and then have a wine class. Hopefully you've left some wine left over for the class. But 7 p.m. seems to be the right time. And again, we're making that assumption. And so if that's not the right time, let us know. We will think about it and figure out if there's others that have the same opinion. And then in terms of the day, because Venovium is open Thursday through Sunday currently, it's very difficult to do a class on those days. Um, and we also wanted to add value and be a part of your lives on, on days that were not open. So currently we're thinking Wednesdays at 7 p.m., um, and on the kind of the, the, the schedule we're looking at really, we're going to try every other week. So twice a month, we'll do a class on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. That's a great idea. So Pam, Claire, and Audrey basically said for, if you're going to do it at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday, give us ideas for pairings. We will definitely do that. Yeah, and so right now, to kind of give you an idea of the next three classes, um, I know that Julia, we talked about it this morning, Julia Dixon, she wants to do a class on uh, if you drink this, then that, or if this, then that, which is if you're drinking cabs and Syrahs or Pinot Noirs all the time, here's kind of an equivalent. And it's, she's going to have uh, her own wines that she's going to talk about. Um, they're going to be kind of esoteric wines, wines that you may not think to go buy. And it's an opportunity for you to ask questions about uh, what you're normally drinking, but Obviously, there's going to be a discussion about the varietals that she selected and the regions that she selected. Um, the second class is more about production, you know, uh, kind of a hyper focus on oak and what oak means and what does it mean to be oaked versus non oaked and how do we select oak and kind of the implications of oak. So a little bit more on production. And then Julia uh, is, is, is a wine professional that in her own right is pursuing her own career and she is in the middle of importing wines from the country of Georgia. So it's very important for her to talk about those wines. And so it'll be a class on the country of Georgia, which is the, the oldest wine region in the world for making wines. It's a wine culture that dates 8,000, 10,000 years ago. And so very rich culture, wines that are highly complex with a ton of story um, that really say something special. Can we get these, those wines from Georgia? Yeah, so there are wines from the country of Georgia in the market. Um, I know that she's in the process of importing wines that she has personally hand selected. But in the meantime, until those wines become available, we'll just use what's uh, currently in the market. Uh, Michelle wants a sparkling wine class. Yeah, definitely. I think a sparkling wine class would be tremendous. Um, so again, you guys, it's, it's super humbling to know that this is something that you're interested in. Um, I know that because of COVID, it gives us an opportunity to revamp our schedule for events here in the tasting room. Uh, we had originally intended to expand the education classes in general. And so there's going to be more educational opportunities that are in person because the in-person classes allow us to taste 
nine, 10, 12 wines in one setting instead of just two. So it's super important to still meet in person because you get that, you get that range all in one experience versus us trying to really tell a full story through the lens of two wines. Um, so look forward to more classes here in the lounge. And obviously we'll continue uh, trying to do these virtual classes um, virtually. Um, the one last comment about YouTube, um, I, I, I mentioned it last class, we did post the classes, the, the Pinot Noir class and the Cap Franc class are, are now available online. Um, it, 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 this is again, kind of a byproduct of COVID. The classes needed to live somewhere. I wanted it to be a place where you can go back and reference if you wanted to reference, you can fast forward or reverse. It's unlike a Facebook live video where one, it's hard to find and then two, you have to watch it from the beginning. Um, it's better quality. And then if this grows into something, it actually can be a, um, a revenue center for, for me or for Vinovium, which is, uh, you know, you gotta make a living. And so it's something super exciting. And so this idea of a YouTube channel has been now at the forefront of my mind. How do I, how do we capitalize on that? How do we make it interesting? How do we make it um, worthy content of your time? And if you know me and my background, you know that I've been trying to create content for the Texas wine industry for many years through the nonprofit and through rating and judging wines. And so um, the idea of creating quality content for the Texas wine industry is super important to me, but also educational content that our people that follow us and like us and, and want to learn more from us can get access to. So I will be continuing the YouTube channel in some form or fashion. We're working that out as we go. Again, all the classes that we record virtually will be on the YouTube channel, whether it's me teaching them or another wine educator. And so it's, it's an exciting time and uh, we couldn't be happier to kind of be open again and also see where the rest of 2020 takes us. So I hope you get to see and come hang out with us soon. A lot of events are still on the schedule. Unfortunately, Red Wine and Blue for 2020, uh, to be honest, I think that that event is going to get canceled for this year and we're going to look at it uh, for next year just because there's already too much on the schedule. Everyone's going to be wanting to catch up. It's like hard to figure out the, the right day and time and uh, a month to actually make that event happen. But definitely other events are going to continue and expand and, and grow and hopefully you're part of that. All right, friends, I, I think I've talked a lot. <laughs> And I know I went over my time, but that's okay. And I really appreciate you guys and uh, hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday and uh, happy hump day. Get to humping. <laughs>